You're with Work Live from BBC News with Sally Bundock and Tim Wilcox. Don't go to the theatre, don't go to the cinema, don't go to the pub. The message from the British Prime Minister, but how will businesses cope? Live from London, that's our top story today, Tuesday the 17th of March. It's a similar picture across Europe. Governments take drastic measures to fight the pandemic. Spanish military are on the streets while France bans people from leaving their homes. Also in the programme, the city that never sleeps shuts down. We visit the empty streets of New York. And the best of business, how one leading beverage brand is turning its tipple into much needed hand sanitizer. We'll also be getting the inside track on the plight of small businesses. What should the government be doing? We ask one of Britain's best-known businessmen, John Cordwell, the founder of Phones for You. As Britain is set to announce more measures to help struggling firms, we want to know how is it affecting your life and your work. Let us know. Hashtag BBC Work Life. A warm welcome to the programme and we're looking at what's going on in the UK where the government will announce more financial measures to help the economy during the outbreak. Amid warnings, the latest restrictions could put firms out of business. Late Monday, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a dramatic increase in restrictions and precautions. So the UK Finance Minister or Chancellor of the Exchequer, if you prefer, Rishi Sunak, will be announcing measures later today to help firms. This comes after several big manufacturers announced shutdowns in their European operations. If we look at the car industry, you've got Vauxhall's parent company, PSA Group, and Fiat Chrysler uh, talking about closures. In France, President Macron announced a ban on people leaving their homes unless it is essential. And in the past hour, Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire has announced a $50 billion aid package for businesses. The government's forecasting a 1% drop in gross domestic product this year. In other words, the economy shrinking. Well, let's talk to our correspondent in Paris, Hugh Schofield. Hugh, tell us more about today's announcement, help for businesses in France. Well, I mean, it's, it's part of a, an ongoing programme of help that the government's been announcing. And yesterday, Macron said there would be a $300 billion Euro uh, a loan guarantee from the government to the bank so that uh, companies, big and small, can uh, continue to operate. And then there's this money that is going to be given today. I'm not sure in wh quite what form, but we've had some ideas already. Uh, for example, uh, any company that uh, whose, whose staff have to go on kind of temporary unemployment will, fi will have the salaries that they continue to pay reimbursed by uh, the government. Uh, Small companies that find themselves, you know, likely to go under, will will be able to defer payment of their social charges, of their taxes, of their gas, electricity bills. All this is going to add up and um, come to a very uh, important bill, which the government is basically saying we will foot. Uh, and the, the watchword from uh, Macron yesterday and from Bruno Le Maire today is uh, whatever it costs, we will pay. The, the, the government is quite clear that um, they, the, they want the country to come out at the end of this able to function and with companies still in in, in a good state with their staff still in employment, even if they've, they've actually been idle for the, the previous, uh, you know, one or two months. All right, Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Hugh Schofield in Paris is what the French are doing in terms of help for business, Tim. Yeah, uh, Sally, in Britain, uh, we're expecting fresh measures uh, later to help stricken businesses. Let's speak to uh, Edwin Morgan, Director of uh, Policy at the Institute of Directors. Uh, not very much has been allocated so far, so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, later on today. But mm. how is business going to how is business going to cope with this shutdown? I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Clearly, things have moved very fast in the announcement. I think one of the sort of complaints from businesses was that we got this huge announcement quite late in the day yesterday. Um, you know, it's moved faster than the government have prepared us in, in a way. So for industries like um, hospitality in particular, lots of them are saying, well, you've, you've given us this kind of halfway position. Are we, do we actually have to close? What about the insurance? So I think... Because well, it's, it's a suggestion, in other words. I mean, but France, yeah. I've just heard from Hugh, I mean, this is a blank cheque. 
I, absolutely. I mean, the, the measures that the French announced do seem to be much more substantial. So we would be certainly looking for something big from the Chancellor this afternoon. What do you think they can offer in mm. terms of help? There's lots of ideas out there. And, and now what was announced in the budget last week mm. sounds like a drop in the ocean, doesn't it? So I think we've got two things, the additional measures, so things like holidays on business rates, VAT, employers national insurance would be very welcome. At the same time, things that were announced but aren't actually up and running, so uh, a loan scheme through the British Business Bank, which is a government-owned bank, um, it's been announced, but it isn't actually available. Firms can't get the money yet. So a lot of it just accelerating, making this stuff get out the door so businesses can get it now. Should the government also, instead of suggesting, actually mm. be, be making decisions? Because then insurance policies would kick in. Mm. I mean, how much is that playing into this debate, do you think? I, I mean, I think the, the message last night from, from pubs, restaurants, uh, theatres, etc. is very clear that they, they needed the firm rule on closing and then they because get then the they have yeah. ways of, of, of compensation because theaters for example mm. if theaters are closed for several months mm. i mean that they that could cause them to go under if they have no financial yeah. system it's fair to say that isn't it oh oh absolutely i mean we are we are very much looking at a situation where if, if lots of businesses are closed for a substantial amount of time uh, their ability to, to survive if they don't get assistance is, is really in doubt. Easter holidays coming up, mm. uh, no demand from the government yet to uh, pull children out of school. Mm. I mean, presumably they're, they're trying to delay that because the knock-on impact of that, knock-on effect for mm. business, would be, would be huge as well, wouldn't it? With yeah. parents, working parents, having to mm. look after their children as well. Absolutely. It's going to be very, very difficult for, for companies to manage. I mean, we, obviously we represent individual directors and they are faced by a huge number of choices now. They've got their employees to manage. Um, how do they give them flexibility? Because people are going to have to be flexible with, with childcare requirements. Their suppliers you know, continuing to pay them as well. Companies working together. I mean, I think one of the slightly worrying things that we've heard is, you know, are larger companies actually going to slow some of their payments to small suppliers, that kind of thing? And we would absolutely say no, that everyone has to pull together. The government has to provide, you know, the, the big firepower only the government can do. But then everyone has to act responsibly and think, you know, think of the end of this, because we, we will get through this. And in the meantime, we can't, you know, kind of well, when, go dog when, dog. When, when are we going to yeah. get through it? That is the, the question. Edwin Morgan, thank you uh, very much. Well, let's uh, look at what's going on in Asia, where more travel restrictions have been put in place there to stop the spread of coronavirus. If you look at Hong Kong, anyone arriving there into the territory will be placed into quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, well, the Philippines has uh, also imposed uh, travel restrictions, and in Malaysia, the government will bar people crossing its border into Singapore. Shanjit Lail uh, joins us now from there. Shanjit. Well, that's right. I mean, I literally just got back from filming the bridge that divides Singapore and Malaysia. It was bumper to bumper traffic, people making their way from Malaysia to Singapore. It literally been traffic that had built up for hours. And this is amongst the busiest border crossings in the world. And that's after the Malaysian government, as you said, banned all visitors and residents from traveling overseas. Now, an estimated 350,000 people a day commute between Malaysia and Singapore for work. Many, of course, live uh, uh, they, they work in Singapore, they live in the Malaysian state of Johor, right next to Singapore. Uh, what we know is that Singapore is taking steps to open dormitories and hotels for many of the Malaysian workers who are based here. But we know it's not just workers, actually. Malaysia supplies a lot of Singapore's food needs, and that's prompted the city's trade minister to reassure Singaporeans that the city has done enough to ensure supplies. Sharonjit with the uh, latest from there. Thank you very much. Well, let's look at markets then, because, of course, Monday has been named. It's another one, another Black Monday. We had some <coughs> dramatic losses across the world on Monday. You can see that illustrated by the Dow there at the bottom of the screen. That's how the Dow ended on Wall Street Monday. So that reflects what was happening in Asia, a very flat session as investors remain on edge, not knowing which way to go right now. Let's have a look at Europe. Uh, we're seeing slight gains across Europe, but for Germany and France, uh, stronger gains. I would imagine that the CAC 40 in Paris has been boosted by the action taken at government level. We were just talking about the finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, uh, saying there is more money in the pot to support businesses under severe pressure right now. However, in the UK, we're waiting for similar measures. FTSE 100, though, up by 0.7 of a percent. Look at that, pound uh, pummel as well, isn't it, against the dollar and the uh, yep, euro? Yeah, you can see well. it there, a pound yeah. by yeah. $1.22 yeah. at the moment.
Let's have a look at uh, some of the other stories uh, making the news this hour. Uh, we're going to be staying with the uh, coronavirus outbreak. New Zealand has uh, launched a stimulus package in its fight uh, against the effects of the pandemic and the, on the economy. The uh, $7.3 billion package includes covering wages for people who are required to self-isolate but cannot work from home and also those caring for relatives who are sick. The U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin says he is seeking a big number for an additional stimulus package intended to crop, prop up the world's biggest economy amidst this outbreak. He wouldn't give much detail, but Mr. Mnuchin wants lawmakers to agree additional measures targeting airlines and small businesses, and they want to deliver an announcement this week. Amazon says it will hire 100,000 warehouse and delivery uh, workers in the United States to deal with a surge in sales during the pandemic. Uh, the online retail giant also said it would increase pay for its staff in Britain, uh, US and in Europe as well. And this story dominates uh, newspapers, websites, online, as you can imagine. We've got Alison Stewart Allen with us, Chief Executive of the Marketing Consultancy, International Marketing Partners. Lovely to see you, Alison. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, this story you've picked out in the Financial Times, European distillers turning to make uh, sanitizers to tackle the shortage. So... G&T is off the menu. <laughs> We're not interested. We just want to keep ourselves clean right now. Absolutely. Maybe G&T will be renamed Germs and something, something else. else. Right? Some, some of these spirits are probably, Germ Terminator. Some, some of these spirits are probably better at ha hand gel than drinking. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, the challenge, though, for the distillers in making alcohol that we can use on our hands is that it has to be made denat. In other words, you can't you know, drink it. Uh, and in order to make DNAT alcohol, you also need to be licensed. And so one of the challenges is, can these distillers get licenses quickly in order to create you know, alcohol that we can use on our hands and in hospitals, schools, etc. What strikes me most about this story is that you have the perfumeries in France, as well as the traditional Pernod Ricard and other uh, well-known uh, alcohol drinks makers interestingly now getting involved uh, and so you know the perfume industry knows how to make alcohol uh, for this purpose uh, but it what it proves is how innovative we can really be when we need to be. How, <laughs> how easy is it to do this as well? I mean, is it a straightforward process? Uh, well, the alcoholic uh, beverage industry, the gin, the scotch whiskey, uh, vodka, etc., white spirits in particular, um, already have 96% alcohol on hand, and they use that. But you don't need that. You, according to WHO, I was interested yeah. in this FTP, saying that 60% uh, is the figure for the WHO for it yes. to be effective against a virus. Exactly. Yeah. But if you already have stock of 96% yeah. alcohol on hand and on site, then you can cut that to a 60% solution fairly easily. Now, The Guardian is looking at another angle to this story. Easter wedding bells are off as couple comes to terms with coronavirus. It talks about the length of time, the cost, the energy to plan a wedding. And, and I have to say, when I read this, I was thought about my nephew who's getting married in June and his fiancée, she's already cancelled her hen party in Paris. It's a small issue in a way but it's a big deal isn't it the fact is so many people are traveling all around the world yes isn't it? i mean for if you compare reasons. this to 40 40 years ago yep. you wouldn't have best men flying in no. from all over the of world of course you wouldn't and, and now yeah. yes and now, and now it's an international yeah. affair of course it? it is yeah. of course it is because people now live all over the world uh, the, a wedding is an excuse to reunite families. Yeah. Uh, and now when we're dislocated with uh, self-isolation and mandatory quarantining, uh, you know, a wedding is an opportunity in uh, many minds to bring families together. And the sad part of all this is that all the auxiliary services around weddings, so cake designers, um, tux hire, mm. dress uh, makers and retailers, the cakes, the wedding planners. I mean, there's a whole industry around the wedding. Most of those people are self-employed. So this is going to now be the tricky part. And I if the bride and groom, who may or may not have thought to take out insurance cover for something like this, they wouldn't have foreseen this, but whether it would be covered anyway in an insurance policy. It's, yes. an, act of, it's, it's an act of God. Of it? course. And, yeah. and many uh, other similar uh, services are seen as force majeure or act of God. I suppose just very briefly, I mean, you know, I think Italy's going to open its borders uh, early April, isn't it? April 3rd. So, what, so they so, say so, now, so, Tim. So, well, <laughs> so, so they say, so maybe, maybe if you've got something for May. You know, or June. 
tune. Oh, yes. Hang, hang in there. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. We yep. hope so. OK, Alison, uh, thank you very thank much you. for taking us through just a couple of those uh, papers there. So, more to come in work life, including the harsh economic impact of this outbreak. We're going to hear from one well-known businessman about how companies should be helped and how they should be assisted by the government. You are watching uh, Work Life from BBC News. So what will the impact be on the UK economy in terms of its growth? Uh, many are arguing we, we could see the weakest growth this year for almost 30. Well, interesting, actually, because the British Chambers of Commerce uh, is predicting that uh, not including the 2008 financial crisis, growth will be subdued uh, once the government have boosted the economy, economy as well. Alan uh, Marshall is Director General of the uh, British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, and uh, just looking at the figures, it's interesting. I mean, you're talking about subdued, but not that much, I didn't think. I think your original prediction was uh, 1% and you've reduced it to 0.8%. Yes, of course, much can happen in 24 hours, and this is an evolving situation. Uh, it is, of course, our hope and everyone's hope that the impact on the economy is felt more in the first half of the year uh, and that business can start to return to normal in the second half of this financial year. But bearing in mind what we're already seeing in the past few days, it's not going to be 0.2 percent. It could be much more, couldn't it? Yes, of course, that, you know, any situation is possible at the moment, which is why we're saying this morning uh, that everyone needs to start to do more. Uh, the government's got to do more. Uh, it's got to come forward today with additional packages of support for business uh, to support cash flow in particular. So you've got a lot of companies out there who will have tax bills coming due on a monthly or quarterly basis that will find it difficult to pay those. The government's got to look at a holiday uh, for businesses around rates, uh, around national insurance and around VAT. Um, but also banks are going to have to do more. Uh, financial institutions are going to have to do everything they can to support the real economy through what is a, probably the most difficult period we have seen, certainly since the 2008-2009 financial crisis. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there because we are out of time. But, Adam, thank you very much indeed. Adam Marshall there, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. Another voice, many voices, who are saying the government needs to do more to support businesses. Well, and we've got, and uh, we'll we've got the Chancellor in a few hours' time. Let's yes, see what, let's see we what shall hear do. what they are suggesting. We're hearing lots of things, actually, at the BBC. One of the... Uh, a comment is that possibly uh, there could be help for airline industry in particular uh, with an announcement expected on emergency measures to support the airlines. This is another story. Car phone warehouse not to do with coronavirus to close many stores. Hello, you're watching uh, Work Life, a reminder of our top story this hour. Don't go to the theatre, don't go to the cinema, don't go to the pub. That's the message from the British Prime Minister. But how will businesses cope? Well, let's take a look at what's going on in New York City, because it too has had to close bars, restaurants. People are being told to stay at home. Uh, while uh, necessary, it will have a devastating impact, of course, on the Big Apple's economy. Uh, Samira Hussain explains. The city that never sleeps is grinding to a halt. Despite 8 million people living here, there were very few people roaming the streets of Manhattan. During the lunch hour rush, this food court would normally be packed. City officials have closed all public schools and have instructed restaurants to do the same and offer only takeaway or delivery. Movie theaters, bars and gyms are all shut and could be for a very long time. As people work from home, local businesses are already bearing the brunt. No business. It's zero business. This is supposed to be my rush hour. This is the time to make money. It's not making money and even it's not cover my, my costs. And I'm really, I don't have any imagination what, I, what I'm going to do for, for my bill, for my life. For, it's a very, very, very bad time. The coronavirus will inflict a massive amount of damage on New York City's economy, with officials estimating a loss of more than $3 billion in tax revenue in the next six months. We are on a path 
that is a trajectory that does not look positive. I believe it's more likely we could be in a recession today than I was a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. I think that we have to have all hands on deck now. We're going to need help from the federal government. But the federal government remains absent with no new bill to shield Americans from the economic fallout of the coronavirus. For now, though, one famous New York gathering spot remains open, the New York Stock Exchange. But traders on the floor are not having a very good time as financial markets continue their freefall. The moves to close America's largest city may be necessary to preserve public health and the health system. But there is very little doubt that it will have a devastating impact on the health of this city and the country's economy. Samira Hussein, BBC News, New York. So that is the view uh, from uh, New York. Now, working from home, anywhere, especially in the UK now, well, self-quarantine, cancelled sporting events, all new measures aimed to stem the coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, social distancing may help mitigate the pandemic. It's bad news, though, for companies that rely on people to come to work and be in the workplace uh, in order to, to get by where they can't work from home. So how bad is uh, the problem for businesses and the economy? Uh, our guest, John Caldwell, a uh, billionaire, businessman, uh, philanthropist uh, who co-founded the mobile phone retailer Phones uh, for You. We're in tough times. Uh, is the government doing enough? We haven't had a blank cheque, have we, that uh, the French have offered? Well, we don't, we don't know whether the government are doing enough yet until the Chancellor's statement this afternoon. I, however, suspect not. Now, I think it's absolutely vital that the Chancellor this afternoon tells all businesses that their position will be protected throughout this coronavirus uh, as if the coronavirus didn't exist. In other words, to be left in a position at the end of the coronavirus to be able to fight back. I don't believe the government should protect the profits, but what they should do is protect the capital base of the business so that the business doesn't go under. And if they don't do that, Though, depending on how long the virus lasts, there'll be potentially millions of unemployed and thousands or tens of thousands of businesses going under. And the devastation post-coronavirus will be just too, too severe to even contemplate. So we must take really, really drastic action and guarantee to leave businesses in a strong position to fight back post-corona. What about the argument that the strain on public spending will just be too great later? We might rescue businesses now, but we'll pay too much for that later. Well, let me make clear, first of all, that I'm not ever an advocate of, borrow of government borrowing. I think the government borrowing is too great at the moment. But there are a time, at, and this is the one time other than the 2008 crash, where government borrowing has to save the day. And the cost of, to the uh, exchequer of not doing this action will be way, way greater than making the action. So yes, I estimate government borrowing might go up into the two trillion bracket, increased by about 200 billion as a result of this rescue. It's only a rough estimate because I don't know how long the virus is going to last. But if it lasts uh, <laughs> according to most estimates, then it's probably going to be potentially 200 billion pounds that needs injecting. But if they don't do that, the cost to society in the long run will be way more than 200 billion. And the cost of human suffering, not health suffering, but financial suffering will be devastating. Uh, and that's much more than uh, the Chancellor's been talking about thus, that, thus far. Anyway, it's just t t a couple of some viewers have been... Well, you like, know, just on to that yeah. point, because it's an important point. We don't need to talk of limits. We don't need to talk of 20 billion, 50 billion or 200 billion. What we need to say is, whatever the disaster of this virus, it will be we'll cover it. Yeah. And if that's only 20 billion because it doesn't last very long, wonderful. Yeah. If it's 200 billion, well, okay. But there are ways of implementing that, you know, because what we could do is give interest-free loans through the banks that are supporting the businesses, and we could make it a loan to the business, interest-free, that is repayable from future profits at a rate of, say, 20% of net profits per year. We could do it in a way that solves the the government's balance sheet in the future, but solve the problem today. And that's really what we need to do. We've got to solve this problem 
and it's got to be limitless as to how much the government puts in. The only issue is the methodology. And interest-free okay. loans through the banks would solve the problem. And yeah. this is exactly what our viewers are saying. If we if we illustrate some, we've heard from people like so Paula says, her husband, he's self-employed, he runs a barber's, he's deeply worried. What's going to happen if he has to close because they announce he has to? We cannot survive this. I yeah. mean, that's one illustration of a small business. And there are millions business. of people like that, not just self-employed, but millions of people in small to medium enterprise and in large enterprises who are going to be borrowing off the credit cards and getting hugely in debt. And when we get post-corona, post uh, if there's not enough done by the government, those people will be hugely in debt and there'll be no, public, there'll be no spending to refinance the businesses. So we really, really do need to financially neutralise this at the cost of the government's balance sheet short term. What, what are you doing for, for your uh, form of business in terms of your philanthropy as well? I mean, are, are you putting something concrete in as well? Well, I, I can't do anything about the philanthropic aims that we've got because they have been dramatically hit. We're looking at cancelling events all the time. But what I am going to do is put my own money in and uh, compensate for the lack of money. So if the charity starts suffering dramatically on lack of finances, I'll just put more of my money, and I already finance Thank you. I'm sorry to stop you, but we are out of time. But Jack, okay. thank you very thank much. Thank you. And thank you too for your many comments. Hashtag BBC Work Life is the place to look at those. Bye-bye.